97. We went and stood by the car. No one said anything for a few minutes. Colonel Julian handed round his cigarette case. Pavel looked grey, rather shaken. I noticed his hands were trembling as he held the match. The man with the barrel organ ceased playing for a moment and hobbled towards us, his cap in his hand. Maxim gave him two shillings. Then he went back to the barrel organ and started another tune. The church clock struck six o'clock. Favell began to speak. His voice was diffident, careless, but his face was still grey. He didn't look at any of us. He kept glancing down at his cigarette and turning it over in his fingers. This cancer business, he said. Does anybody know if it's contagious? No one answered him. Colonel Julian shrugged his shoulders. I never had the remotest idea, said Favell jerkily. She kept it a secret from everyone, even Danny. What a goddamn appalling thing, eh? Not the sort of thing one would ever connect with Rebecca. Do you fellows feel like a drink? I'm all out over this, and I don't mind admitting it. Cancer. Oh, my God. He leant up against the side of the car and shaded his eyes with his hands. Tell that bloody fellow with a barrel organ to clear out, he said. I can't stand that goddamn row. Wouldn't it be simpler if we went ourselves, said Maxim. Can you manage your own car, or do you want Julian to drive it for you? Give me a minute, said Favell. I'll be all right. You don't understand. This thing has been a damned unholy shock to me. Pull yourself together, man, for heaven's sake, said Colonel Julian. If you want a drink, go back to the house and ask Baker. He knows how to treat for shock, I dare say. Don't make an exhibition of yourself in the street. Oh, you're all right. You're fine, said Favell, standing straight and looking at Colonel Julian and Maxim. You've got nothing to worry about any more. Max is on a good wicket now, isn't he? You've got your motive, and Baker will supply it in black and white, free of cost, whenever you send the word. You can dine at Mandalay once a week on the strength of it and feel proud of yourself. No doubt Max will ask you to be the godfather to his first child. Shall we get in the car and go? said Colonel Julian to Maxim. We can make our plans going along. Maxim held open the door of the car and Colonel Julian climbed in. I sat down in my seat in the front. Favell still leant against the car and didn't move. I should advise you to get straight back to your flat and go to bed, said Colonel Julian shortly, and drive slowly or you'll find yourself in jail for manslaughter. I may as well warn you now, as I shall not be seeing you again, that as a magistrate I have certain powers that will prove effective if you ever turn up in Kerry for the district. Blackmail is not much of a profession, Mr. Favell, and we know how to deal with it in our part of the world, strange though it may seem to you. Favell was watching Maxim. He'd lost the grey colour now and the old, unpleasant smile was forming on his lips. Yes, it's been a stroke of luck for you, Max, hasn't it? he said slowly. You think you've won, don't you? The law can get you yet, and so can I in a different way. Maxim switched on the engine. Have you anything else you want to say, he said, because if you have, you had better say it now. No, said Favell, no, I won't keep you. You can go. He stepped back on the pavement, the smile still on his lips. Car slid forward. As we turned the corner, I looked back and saw him standing there watching us, and he waved his hand, and he was laughing. We drove on for a while in silence. Then Colonel Julian spoke. He can't do anything, he said. That smile and that wave were part of his bluff. They're all alike, those fellows. He hasn't a thread of a case to bring now. Baker's evidence would squash it. Maxim didn't answer. I glanced sideways at his face, but it told me nothing. I always felt the solution would lie in Baker, said Colonel Julian. The furtive business of that appointment and the way she never even told Mrs. Danvers. She had her suspicions, you see. She knew something was wrong. Dreadful thing, of course, very dreadful. Enough to send a young and lovely woman right off her head. We drove on along the straight main road. Telegraph poles, motor coaches, open sports cars, little semi-detached villas with new gardens. They flashed past, making patterns in my mind. I should always remember. Suppose you never had any idea of this to winter, said Colonel Julian. No, said Maxim, no. Of course, some people have a morbid dread of it, said Colonel Julian. Women, especially. 
That must have been the case with your wife. She had courage for every other thing but that. She couldn't face pain. Well, she was spared that at any rate. Yes, said Maxim. I don't think it would do any harm if I quietly let it be known down in Kerith and in the county that a London doctor has supplied us with a motive, said Colonel Julian, just in case there should be any gossip. You never can tell, you know. People are odd sometimes. If they knew about Mrs. de Winter, it might make it a lot easier for you. Yes, said Maxim, yes. I understand. It's curious and very irritating, said Colonel Julian slowly. How long stories spread in country districts. I never know why they should, but unfortunately they do. Not that I anticipate any trouble over this, but it's as well to be prepared. People are inclined to say the wildest things if they're given half a chance. Yes, said Maxim. You and Crawley, of course, can squash any nonsense in Mandalay or the estate, and I can deal with it effectively in Kerith. I shall say a word to my girl, too. She sees a lot of the younger people who very often are the worst offenders in storytelling. I don't suppose the newspapers will worry you any more. That's one good thing. You'll find they'll drop the whole affair in a day or two. Yes, said Maxim. We drove on through the northern suburbs and came once more to Finchley and Hampstead. Half past six, said Colonel Julian. What do you propose doing? I've got a sister living in St. John's Wood and feel inclined to take her unawares and ask for dinner and then catch the last train from Paddington. I know she doesn't go away for another week. I'm sure she'd be delighted to see both of you as well. Maxim hesitated and glanced at me. It's very kind of you, he said, but I think we had better be independent. I must ring up Frank in one thing and another. I dare say we shall have a quiet meal somewhere and start off again afterwards, spending the night at the pub on the way. I rather think that's what we shall do. Of course, said Colonel Julian. I quite understand. Could you throw me out at my sister's? It's one of those turnings off the avenue road. When we came to the house, Maxim drew up a little way ahead of the gate. It's impossible to thank you, he said, for all you've done today. You know what I feel about it without my telling you. My dear fellow, Colonel Julian, I've been only too glad. If we'd known what bacon you, of course, there would have been none of this at all. However, never mind about that now. You must put the whole thing behind you as a very unpleasant and unfortunate episode. I'm pretty sure you won't have any more trouble from Favell. If you do, I count on you to tell me at once. I shall know how to deal with him. He climbed out of the car, collecting his coat and his map. I shall feel inclined, he said, not looking directly at us, to get away for a bit. Take a short holiday. Uh, go abroad, perhaps. We didn't say anything. Colonel Julian was fumbling with his map. Switzerland is very nice this time of year, he said. I remember we went once for the girls' holidays and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. The walks are delightful. He hesitated, cleared his throat. It is just faintly possible certain little difficulties might arise, he said, not from Favelle, but from one or two people in the district. One never knows quite what Tab has been saying and repeating and so on. Absurd, of course. But you know the old saying, out of sight, out of mind, if people aren't there to be talked about, the talk dies. It's the way of the world. He stood for a moment, counting his belongings. I've got everything, I think. Map, glasses, stick, coat, everything complete. Well, goodbye, both of you. Don't get overtired. It's been a long day. He turned in at the gate and went up the steps. I saw a woman come to the window and smile and wave her hand. We drove away down the road and turned the corner. I leant back in my seat and closed my eyes. Now that we were alone again and the strain was over, the sensation was one of almost unbearable relief. It was like the bursting of an abscess. Maxim did not speak. I felt his hand cover mine. We drove on through the traffic and I saw none of it. I heard the rumble of the buses, the hooting of taxis, that inevitable, tireless London roar, but I was not part of it. I rested in some other place that was cool, and quiet and still. Nothing could touch us any more. We had come through our crisis. When Maxim stopped the car, I opened my eyes and sat up. We were opposite one of those numerous little restaurants in the narrow street in Soho. I looked about me, dazed and stupid. You're tired, said Maxim briefly, empty and tired and fit for nothing. You'll be better when you've had something to eat. So shall I. 
We'll go in here and order dinner right away. I can telephone to Frank too. We got out of the car. There was no one in the restaurant but the maitre d'hôtel and a waiter and a girl behind the desk. It was dark and cool. We went to a table right in the corner. Maxim began ordering the food. Pavel was right about wanting a drink, he said. I want one too, and so do you. You're going to have some brandy. The maitre d'hôtel was fat and smiling. He produced long, thin rolls in paper envelopes. They were very hard, very crisp. I began to eat one ravenously. My brandy and soda were soft, warming, curiously comforting. When we've had dinner, we'll drive slowly, very quietly, said Maxim. It'll be cool, too, in the evening. We'll find somewhere on the road we can put up for the night. Then we can get along to Mandalay in the morning. Yes, I said. You didn't want to dine with Julian's sister and go down by the late train. No. Maxim finished his drink. His eyes looked large and they were ringed with the shadows. They seemed very dark against the pallor of his face. How much of the truth, he said, do you think Julian guessed? I watched him over the rim of my glass. I didn't say anything. He knew, said Maxim slowly. Of course he knew. If he did, I said, he'll never say anything. Never, never. No, said Maxim. No. He ordered another drink from the maitre d'hôtel. We sat silent and peaceful in our dark corner. I believe, said Maxim, that Rebecca lied to me on purpose. The last supreme bluff. She wanted me to kill her. She foresaw the whole thing. That's why she laughed. That's why she stood there laughing when she died. I didn't say anything. I went on drinking my brandy and soda. It was all over. It was all settled. It did not matter any more. There was no need for Maxim to look white and troubled. It was her last practical joke, said Maxim. The best of them all. And I'm not sure if she hasn't won. Even now. What do you mean? How can she have won? I said. I don't know, he said. I don't know. He swallowed his second drink. Then he got up from the table. I'm going to nag up Frank, he said. I sat there in my corner and presently the waiter brought me my fish. It was lobster, very hot and good. I had another brandy and soda too. It was pleasant and comfortable sitting there, and nothing mattered very much. I smiled at the waiter and asked for some more bread in French for no reason. I was quiet and happy and friendly in the restaurant. Maxim and I, together. Everything was over. Everything was settled. Rebecca was dead. Rebecca could not hurt us. She had played her last joke, as Maxim had said. She could do no more to us now. In ten minutes, Maxim came back again. Well, I said, my own voice sounding far away. How was Frank? Frank was all right, said Maxim. He was at the office, been waiting there for me to telephone him ever since four o'clock. I told him what had happened. He sounded glad, relieved. Yes, I said. Something rather odd, though, said Maxim slowly, a line between his brows. He thinks Mrs. Danvers has cleared out. She's gone, disappeared. She said nothing to anyone, but apparently she'd been packing up all day, stripping her room of things, and the fellow from the station came for her boxes at about four o'clock. Frith telephoned down to Frank about it, and Frank told Frith to ask Mrs. Danvers to come down to him at the office. He waited. She never came. About ten minutes before I rang up, Frith telephoned to Frank again and said there had been a long-distance call for Mrs. Danvers, which he had switched through to her room, and she had answered. This must have been about ten past six. At a quarter to seven he knocked on the door and found her room empty, her bedroom too. They looked for her and couldn't find her. They think she's gone. She must have gone straight out of the house and through the woods. She never passed the lodge gates. Isn't it a good thing, I said. It saves us a lot of trouble. We should have had to send her away anyway. I believe she guessed too. There was an expression on her face last night. I kept thinking of it, coming up in the car. I don't like it, said Maxim. I do not like it. She can't do anything, I argued. If she's gone, so much the better. It was for Val who telephoned, of course. He must have told her about Baker. He would tell her what Colonel Julian had said. Colonel Julian said if there was any attempt at blackmail, we were to tell him. They won't dare do it. They can't. It's too dangerous. I'm not thinking of blackmail, said Maxim. What else can they do, I said. 
We've got to do what Colonel Julian said. We've got to forget it. We mustn't think about it any more. It's all over, darling. It's finished. We ought to go down on our knees and thank God that it's finished. Maxim didn't answer. He was staring in front of him at nothing. Your lobster will be cold, I said. Eat it, darling. It'll do you good. You want something inside you. You're tired. I was using the words he had used to me. I felt better and stronger. It was I now who was taking care of him. He was tired, pale. I had got over my weakness and fatigue, and now he was the one to suffer from reaction. It was just because he was empty, because he was tired. There was nothing to worry about at all. Mrs. Danvers had gone. We should praise God for that too. Everything had been made so easy for us, so very easy. Eat up your fish, I said. It was going to be very different in future. I wasn't going to be nervous and shy with the servants any more. With Mrs. Danvers gone, I should learn bit by bit to control the house. I would go and interview the cook in the kitchen. They would like me, respect me. Soon it would be as though Mrs. Danvers had never had command. I would learn more about the estate, too. I should ask Frank to explain things to me. I was sure Frank liked me. I liked him, too. I would go into things and learn how they were managed, what they did at the farm, how the work in the grounds was planned. I might take to gardening myself, and in time have one or two things altered. That little square lawn outside the morning room with the statue of the satyr. I didn't like it. We would give the satyr away. There were heaps of things that I could do, little by little. People would come and stay, and I shouldn't mind. There would be the interest of seeing to their rooms, having flowers and books put, arranging the food. We would have children. Surely we would have children. If you finished, said Maxim suddenly, I, I don't think I want any more. Only coffee, black, very strong, please, and the bill, he added to the maitre d'hôtel. I wondered why we must go so soon. It was comfortable in a restaurant, and there was nothing to take us away. I liked sitting there with my head against the sofa back, planning the future idly in a hazy, pleasant way. I could have gone on sitting there for a long while. I followed Maxim out of the restaurant, stumbling a little and yawning. Listen, he said when we were on the pavement. Do you think you could sleep in the car if I wrapped you up with the rug and tucked you down in the back? There's a cushion there, and my coat as well. I thought we were going to put up somewhere for the night, I said blankly. One of those hotels one passes on the road. I know, he said, but I have this feeling I must get down tonight. Can't you possibly sleep in the back of the car? Yes, I said doubtfully. Yes, I suppose so. If we start now, it's a quarter to eight. We ought to be there by half past two, he said. There won't be much traffic on the road. You'd be so tired, I said, so terribly tired. No, he shook, he said. I, I shall be all right. I want to get home. Something's wrong. I know it is. I want to get home. His face was anxious, strange. He pulled open the door and began arranging the rugs and the cushion at the back of the car. What can be wrong, I said. It seems so odd to worry now when everything's over. I can't understand you. He didn't answer. I climbed into the back of the car and lay down with my legs tucked under me. He covered me with the rug. It was very comfortable, much better than I imagined. I settled the pillow under my head. You are right, he said. Are you sure you don't mind? No, I said, smiling. I'm all right. I shall sleep. I don't want to stay anywhere on the road. It's much better to do this and get home. We'll be at Mandalay long before sunrise. He got in front and switched on the engine. I shut my eyes. The car drew away and I felt the slight jolting of the springs under my body. I pressed my face against the cushion. The motion of the car was rhythmic, steady, and the pulse of my mind beat with it. A hundred images came to me when I closed my eyes. Things seen, things known, and things forgotten. They were jumbled together in a senseless pattern, the quill of Mrs. Van Hopper's hat, the hard straight back chairs in Frank's dining room, the wide window in the west wing at Mandalay, the salmon-coloured frock of the smiling lady at the fancy dress ball, a peasant girl in a road near Monte Carlo. Sometimes I saw Jasper chasing butterflies across the lawns. Sometimes I saw Dr. Baker's Scotch terrier scratching his ear beside a deck chair. 
And there was the postman who had pointed out the house to us today, and there was Clarice's mother wiping a chair for me in the back parlour. Ben smiled at me, holding winkles in his hands, and the bishop's wife asked me if I would stay to tea. I could feel the cold comfort of my sheets and my own bed and the gritty shingle in the cove. I could smell the bracken in the woods, the wet moss, and the dead azalea petals. I fell into a strange, broken sleep, waking now and again to the reality of my narrow, cramped position and the sight of Maxim's back in front of me. The dusk had turned to darkness. There were the lights of passing cars upon the road. There were villages with drawn curtains and little lights behind them, and I would move and turn upon my back and sleep again. I saw the staircase at Mandalay and Mrs. Danvers standing at the top in her black dress, waiting for me to go to her. As I climbed the stairs, she backed under the archway and disappeared. I looked for her, and I couldn't find her. Then her face looked at me through a hollow door, and I cried out, and she had gone again. What's the time? I called. But what's the time? Maxim turned round to me, his face pale and ghostly in the darkness of the car. It's half past eleven, he said. We're over halfway already. Uh, try and sleep again. I'm thirsty, I said. He stopped at the next town. The man at the garage said his wife had not gone to bed and she would make us some tea. We got out of the car and stood inside the garage. I stamped up and down to bring the blood back to my hands and feet. Maxim smoked a cigarette. It was cold. A bitter wind blew in through the open garage door and rattled the corrugated roof. I shivered and buttoned up my coat. Yes, it's nippy tonight, said the garage man as he wound the petrol pump. The weather has seemed to break this afternoon. It's the last of the heat waves for this summer. We shall be thinking of fire soon. It was hot in London, I said. Was it? He said. Well, they always have the extremes up there, don't they? We get the first of the bad weather down here. It'll blow hard on the coast before morning. His wife brought us the tea. It tasted of bitter wood, but it was hot. I drank it greedily, thankfully. Already Maxim was glancing at his watch. We ought to be going, he said. It's uh, ten minutes to twelve. I left the shelter of the garage reluctantly. The cold wind blew in my face. The stars raced across the sky. There were threads of cloud, too. Yes, said the garage man. Summer's over for this year. We climbed back into the car. I settled myself once more under the rug. Car went on. I shut my eyes. There was the man with a wooden leg winding his barrel organ, and the tune of Roses in Picardy hummed in my head against the jolting of the car. Frith and Robert carried the tea into the library. The woman at the lodge nodded to me abruptly and called her child into the house. I saw the model boats in the cottage in the cove, and the feathery dust. I saw the cobwebs stretching from the little masts. I heard the rain upon the roof and the sound of the sea. I wanted to get to the happy valley, and it wasn't there. There were woods about me. There was no happy valley. Only the dark trees and the young bracken. The owls hooted. The moon was shining in the windows of Mandalay. There were nettles in the garden, ten foot, twenty foot high. Maxim! I cried. Maxim! Yes, he said. It's all right. I'm here. I, I had a dream, I said. A dream. What was it? He said. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Back again into the moving, unquiet depths. I was writing letters in the morning room. I was sending out invitations. I wrote them all myself with a thick black pen. But when I looked down to see what I had written, it was not my small square handwriting at all. It was long and slanting, with curious pointed strokes. I pushed the cards away from the blotter and hid them. I got up and went to the looking-glass. A face stared back at me that was not my own. It was very pale, very lovely, framed in a cloud of dark hair. The eyes narrowed and smiled, the lips parted. The face in the glass stared back at me and laughed. And I saw then 
that she was sitting on a chair before the dressing table in her bedroom, and Maxim was brushing her hair. He held her hair in his hands, and as he brushed it, he wound it slowly into a thick rope. It twisted like a snake, and he took hold of it with both hands and smiled at Rebecca and put it round his neck. No, I screamed, no, no, we must go to Switzerland. Colonel Julian said we must go to Switzerland. I felt Maxim's hand upon my face. What is it? he said. What's the matter? I sat up and pushed my hair away from my face. Can't sleep, I said. It's no use. You've been sleeping, he said. You slept for two hours. It's quarter past two. We're four miles the other side of Lanyon. It was even colder than before. I shuddered in the darkness of the car. I'll come beside you, I said. We shall be back by three. I climbed over and sat beside him, staring in front of me through the windscreen. You're cold, he said. Yes, I said. The hills rose in front of us and dipped and rose again. It was quite dark. The stars had gone. What time did you say it was, I asked. Twenty past two, he said. It's funny, I said. It, it looks almost as though the dawn was breaking over there, beyond those hills. Can't be, though. It's too early. It's the wrong direction, he said. You're looking west. I know, I said. It's funny, isn't it? He didn't answer, and I went on watching the sky. It seemed to get lighter even as I stared, like the first red streak of sunrise. Little by little, it spread across the sky. It's in winter you see the northern lights, isn't it, I said. Not in summer. That's not the northern lights, he said. That's Mandalay. I glanced at him and saw his face. I saw his eyes. Maxim, I said, Maxim, what is it? He drove faster, much faster. We topped the hill before us and saw Lanyon lying in a hollow at our feet. There, to the left of us, was the silver streak of the river widening to the estuary at Kerith, six miles away. The road to Mandalay lay ahead. There was no moon. The sky above our heads was inky black but the sky on the horizon was not dark at all. It was shot with crimson, like a splash of blood. And the ashes blew towards us with the salt wind from the sea. Mm -hmm.